from ring of fire solar eclipses to exploding electric vehicle batteries and overheating iPhones. Why is everything getting set on fire and who can solve the problem? Thoughts expressed in this podcast are my own views. They do not reflect the values of my employers. Welcome to another episode of the Cross of Connections with Jack Wayne podcast. My name is Jack. We talk about the business of science and how this translates into headlines that may help us understand the jobs of the future. Very recently, you would have seen all these images all over the web around this beautiful ring of fire annual solar eclipse in the photos that photographers are really risking their cameras for and risking their eyes for to see these amazing imagery of the sun being blocked out by the moon and we can see this beautiful ring around the edge and it is this incredible body of heat that serves as the catalyst for this episode's topic which is all around the question of why so many things are catching on fire specifically EVs or electric vehicles being seen as the way of the future, quite a few of them, to the perception of it at least, are catching on fire and the media is quick to look at whether or not this new technology really is truly safe if having these amazing lithium-ion batteries that are very versatile and very portable and mobile, if they're really that safe for the environment. I'm in the process of deciding on buying a new car and making the decision between an electric vehicle or just a petrol car and given the cost of living crisis, I'm still driving a bomb of a car that's 15 years old and one of the doors doesn't even work. So this is a really selfish reason for me to deep dive into whether or not EVs and EV batteries are particularly safe. It is quite unfair the disproportionate amount of coverage there's been on electric vehicles and any perceived danger around electric vehicles because anytime something is new, people are naturally a bit more cautious. Certainly with the autopilot and self-driving features of a lot of these Teslas, Anytime there was an accident or a mild incident, it was reported like crazy, even though car accidents that are man-made and humans driving and hitting each other in car rage, they happen much, much more frequently. But with new technology, the burden of proof for whether or not it's going to be good and whether or not it's scalable and successful, it is much, much higher. You're going to have close to 100% success rate with very little downside for it to be entrenched into business as usual. This article from The Conversation talks about the cause of lithium ion battery fires, why they're so intense and how they should be fought. Two large lithium ion battery fires have been reported in Australia, one that happened in a Sydney airport car park and another one in a battery storage facility here in Queensland. When these lithium ion battery fires break out, the damage is very intense. These fires last a lot longer than you would think they would last. They could leak out some toxic chemicals depending on the makeup of those batteries. The technology within these batteries is fundamentally based upon lithium ion architecture. They are the same batteries that fuel things like your phone as well as your laptops, condensing a lot of of electricity storage capacity within a small amount of space. And when you condense this much energy storage capacity into a small space, and also you put it within the confines of a vehicle that is moving around and it is not in a stationary position, it is potentially bumping into other cars, there is a risk both of damage to the battery itself as well as overheating if you're driving around in different environments where the environmental temperatures are affecting the temperature of the car itself. And when these EV batteries overheat, something called thermal runway is a vulnerability here where the chemical reaction from this overheating can either lead to or can be a result of the fault in a battery that either comes from too high of an ambient temperature in the surroundings or some kind of damage to the battery itself. And when you know it, it's going to catch fire. And these fires can build in their intensity over time. And what's really interesting is that there are attempts at making these batteries and battery packs even bigger to accommodate even more energy storage capacity. And there are these large battery packs called mega packs. They're large lithium based batteries designed by Tesla energy storage to stabilize the grid and prevent power outages across these circuits. And when they they catch fire, it could basically stay on fire for an enormous amount of time, potentially burning for several days. What happens when a fire breaks out within a battery storage facility and certainly within lithium ion batteries, the idea of putting out the fire needs to be quite carefully moderated because the first thing we think of is put water on a fire. But depending on the kind of fire it is, the extinguisher cannot just always be water. It might need to be chemical. It may need to be a powder-based kind of extinguisher. These kinds of lithium ion batteries, the the flame that's been produced when you add water to it, it could actually cause the fire to intensify and the water can react with the lithium to form flammable 
hydrogen gas and that makes it even more perilous. So you really need to know what you're walking into if there is a electric vehicle battery based fire in your immediate vicinity and you can use water to cool the battery down you will need up to 40 times as much water as a normal car fire so sometimes it's safe to just let the battery burn of course you could also sprinkle fine water mist suppress the fire or use specially designed class d fire extinguishers or dry chemical fire extinguishers designed for putting out electrical fires these are pretty standard standard operating procedures this kind of extinguisher with either sodium chloride powder or pressurized argon these can really form this oxygen excluding crust that will suffocate the fire of the oxygen needed to keep it going and put out that fire as safely as it can but if you're not sure how to do that or you don't have access to an extinguisher it appears that the safest thing for EV owners is to just let the fire burn and let it burn and notify the relevant authorities and make sure you're not in the immediate vicinity of that fire. But again, this is somewhat of an unfair headline because vehicles actually catch on fire all the time. And these two publicized incidents, one at a Sydney airport, one at a battery storage facility in Queensland, does not necessarily represent the norm or the status quo for EV owners. And the next article talks about the incidence and frequency of electrical vehicle fires and how rare they may be the headline being electrical vehicle fires are very rare the risk for petrol and diesel vehicles is at least 20 times higher despite all of the recent incidents in the media around electrical vehicle battery fire it is actually very rare available data suggests that fire risk is between 20 to 80 times greater if you're driving either a petrol or diesel vehicle a database that's keeping track of this is one of ev fire safe electrical vehicle battery fires worldwide over a 13 year period 2010 to 2023 out of 30 million electrical vehicles worldwide there's less than 400 verified fires and in australia there's only four electrical vehicle battery fires so really the incidence of these events is very low it's just because there's new technology people are scared of innovation and any negativity catches buzz and catches media attention way more readily that's not to say it's completely safe and indeed we see technology overheat all the time the iphone running super hot when you're doing something very silly and casual like looking through instagram and there are these images this thermal imager of the phone as it's going through various tasks and i don't think any phone should glow like this and it looks kind of scary imagine if you had that in your pocket or your bag if you're going to overheat your lunch or your bum you don't really know what's going on and this is something that's all too common in any kind of technology which uses lithium arm batteries and to better understand this technology this article from vox really goes through the limitations in battery technology technology that we are facing globally at present and when i talk about the limitations of any technology i always like to pause and reflect on how amazing the existing technology already is the revolution that is lithium ion batteries has made our laptops our computers our cameras our phones smaller and smaller and more convenient and enabled careers of digital nomads all over the world so really let's just not criticize it right from the outset acknowledge that it is tremendous innovation and breakthrough that's leaving led us up to this point the high density that is the biggest benefit of lithium arm battery technology is also its biggest weakness given that this high energy density makes it more vulnerable to thermal runway and overheating and any damage to that battery might lead to a spark that then will overheat and start a fire two flaws exist with this lithium arm battery technology beyond the fact that it can be damaged and you can't get fires they seem to have a limit on how many times you can charge and recharge or charge charge and discharge and they need to be replaced over a period of time also there seems to be an upper limit of the storage capacity so especially for evs you don't want to have to recharge or have the fear of recharging your car constantly as you're going on a road trip in australia we love to go on road trips on the weekend and the idea of doing that with an ev just doesn't seem as safe in our minds as doing that with a petrol car even though we probably have to stop for petrol anyway the idea of stopping the recharge with electricity versus refueling it's a nominal difference that depending on the access to circuits might not make a difference to your setting it does not mean innovation can just stop we always want to make better batteries with high capacity to extend that long driving range the ev revolution is contingent on battery technology keeping on improving to understand where the battery can be improved let's look at fundamentally what a lithium ion battery is made up of has a number of components so fundamentally there is an anode and cathode that is passing an electrical current through an electrolyte 
solution, which allows all of these electrical reactions to, to exchange and take place. And this is housed within a casing that's sitting within one single battery unit. In a car, it's not one huge battery. It is a series or panels of these batteries all connected together. And there's a module of lithium ion batteries, each of which having anode and cathode, having this electrolyte solution. That is how this entire panel and module of batteries is made up. It's not just one big battery. It is also complicated by environmental concerns in that the lithium within lithium ion batteries, mining it is not environmentally friendly and there's not enough lithium mines in the world to supply all the EV demand that we will need. Other metals that are commonly used in lithium ion batteries also have their natural resource limitations. For example, cobalt. It is primarily extracted at present in the Democratic Republic of Congo and there are all of these other complicating global geopolitical concerns with mining different things from different countries. That has led people in this sector to think about different ways they can innovate. So instead of using lithium, they could, for example, combine different materials together with lithium, for example, a lithium ion phosphate battery, and that uses a lower cost material in the battery's cathode. The downside is that yes, it can't at present store as much energy as lithium ion batteries, but nevertheless, it seems to be a cheaper way of doing it as opposed to pure lithium within the cathode, you can mix it with other metals, other materials and make it a lot cheaper. They could also consider switching out the anode. Traditionally, it's made up of graphite, but there's also a possibility of switching out for silicon. And the benefit of using silicon anodes is that they can hold up to 10 times as much charge and boost the overall battery capacity. And there's a lot of startups that are investigating using different types of anodes and cathodes in different combinations to make that battery technology either cheaper or high capacity and or safer. The other part of the battery that you could try to improve is the electrolyte, that liquid solution in which the anode and cathode are sitting and then that is housed within a casing. If you made that liquid electrolyte solution a solid, a layer of material like glass or ceramic, then we call this a solid state battery without an electrolyte solution in it. And the advantage of going solid state, you don't have to allow for as much volume to dissipate the heat, and therefore you can make the battery packs and battery modules more compact and smaller in size. You can pack more of these solid state batteries into a given space, and you don't need to cool them using the same kind of infrastructure in place. The heat sink doesn't have to be the same shape or size, and this seems like it is the way of the future. Solid state batteries are still quite expensive to produce relative to their non-solid state electrolyte liquid counterparts. So it doesn't seem to be the solution for the time being. This is not a problem that's going to go away because we will need more and more batteries and all of our consumer electronics. Electric vehicles are getting more and more popular and I think I'll probably get an electric vehicle as my next car. At least it'll have all functioning doors unlike my current vehicle. So this is a problem that the people at the cutting edge of innovation need to be ready to address for it to benefit all of us. And it does have very clear environmental concerns because this report from the CSIRO, CSIRO in Australia, talks about the potential benefit and also the harm resulting from our inability to recycle lithium-ion batteries very effectively or efficiently. In Australia, we produce around 3,300 tons of lithium-ion battery waste every year, and we are not recycling that lithium-ion battery battery waste anywhere near to the level that we can be. In 2021, only 10% of Australians' lithium ion battery waste was recycled. But if you compare that to other more traditional types of batteries, lead acid battery, 99% of lead acid battery waste was recycled in 2021. So we clearly know more about how to recycle that kind of older battery architecture versus the lithium ion batteries that are becoming the default standard. And I've already talked about how lithium mining is very expensive and is very rare. So lithium is not abundant resource we can just extract heaps and heaps of. The fact that we can recycle it from existing lithium ion batteries might resolve one of these issues. And the solution here has to be a cooperation with industry and government and indeed researchers leading this space because there is a lot of opportunity to develop new technologies. Not only does it the trifecta of industry, government and R&D, it also has the potential to really impact the environment in a long-term sustainable way. This CSIRO report about 
Different opportunities, industry, government and research can work together to strengthen Australia's recycling capabilities and build new industries and new employment. I'm going to link it in the show notes below. You can have a read what innovation can lead to both in terms of unintended consequences in a negative way and that we need all this extra lithium ion battery technology but now we have got to figure out a way to recycle it so both of those things were spurred on by the initial need for the lithium ion battery to address this and to meet this gap we need people who are very skilled in all sorts of different disciplines within science in chemistry in engineering policy in government we need all of these people with different expertise to work together to ultimately solve this problem that we will all need to figure out an answer to and that is how do we find more renewable energy how do we make the batteries in our lives that much more efficient and i think at the end of the day the solution to this battery technology and the solution to innovation has to be tighter integration with all the different components if a battery module is overheating that needs to be talking to the other parts of the ev to say look this is overheating can you then cool it down and if all the different parts of your electric vehicle or all the different parts of your phone are being made by different people and different companies and different supply chain manufacturers that is a much harder thing to accomplish the case in point if we go back to the iphone 15 example they were able essentially to push out a software update to reduce the amount of overheating in these new phones where before the latest ios it was quite incandescent in terms of its thermal energy it's emitting but after purely a software update it is a lot cooler between 5 to 10 degrees cooler depending on which part of the phone you're measuring this is purely through a software update and apple can do this because they control every aspect of the supply chain every component of their phone as much as they can everything within the phone talks to each other so you need some companies to have a better holistic understanding of every component that goes into their car and that will also help to mitigate this thermal runway issue this issue of overheating and that will in turn make it hopefully safer for the consumer rather than monopolistic for that particular company these are big problems that don't have an immediate solution you might even call them wicked problems that are system based and have lots of different variables that we don't know exactly how to control the way that we need to tackle these problems is through effective leaders especially within research and innovation if you're interested in the soft skills that science leaders need to have to be effective stewards of cutting edge discoveries you can find out the next episode of the podcast linked up here when it's ready to go my name is jack hope to connect with you again in the next episode